that. Um, before we move to our panel discussion, I would just like to thank a few more of our sponsors for helping to make today a success. So I'd like to thank First Bank of Nigeria, our official banking partner. I would also like to thank InterSwitch, our uh, bronze partner, Freshworks, our official customer experience partner, Temenus, our silver partner, at KPMG, our knowledge partner, as well as all media and supporting partners and our official broadcasting partners. If I was to list all of them, we would be here um, for a long, long time because there are so many, but we really are grateful for all the sponsorships. So now it is time to move into the panel discussion. And the panel discussion, the topic for this discussion is the future of BFSI, where BFSI, and just to make sure that I get it right, is banking, finance, finance services, insurance. So we're looking at the future of this post pandemic and measures that can be taken to convert crisis into an advantage and improve our current business models. So the moderator will be Erwin Van Helden, and hi, Erwin, I already see you. Nice meeting well, you. He is a global digital banking expert and he will lead the discussion. Our panelists are Dennis Zaga. And guys, again, if I've mispronounced your name, please forgive me and send me a note in the chat and tell me how to pronounce it properly. But Dennis Zaga, he's the head SME and business banking digital innovation for FCMB. There's Dina Marie, who is the CEO and co-founder of HR Revolution Magazine in the Middle East. And this is what I love about um, COVID, where the silver linings are, I am looking at people in different countries and we're all here together. You didn't have to fly to Ghana or anywhere else to come and participate. Then there's Japheth Moniwaki and Japheth, please. Forgive me if I haven't pronounced it. He is the CEO of Goodson Capital Partners. Did I do it? Okay, Jaffa. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, then there's Leopold Arma, Divisional Head Digital Banking and Alliances at GT Bank. I know Leo very well. There is Krishna Kant V, founder and CEO at ReviewSoft, and Temofe Obona, Country Manager, West Africa, <clears throat> Inastra. So Erwin, I am handing it over to you. Thank you so much in advance. Thank you, Gillian. And nice seeing you, nice seeing you. I love your uh, summaries in between. They, uh, they make it really comprehensible, very good to understand what the previous speaker has spoken about. So thank well, you for thank that you. as well. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I think, I'm not sure if I can see all the faces, but we have a, a great, uh, great set of people here in the panel. Um, we have, two people who are actually working in the business, in, in banking business. We have two people who are working in supply roles. We have one asset manager and we have one HR representative. In, in my eyes, that means that we have more or less the whole value chain of uh, BFSI as it has been, meant, as it has been named uh, present in this panel. Uh, what we are discussing in this panel is uh, what is the impact of the, of the pandemic first and foremost? In terms of we have an economical impact, that's a health and health issue, but there's an economical impact as well. How are banks stepping up and making sure they can address the issues and, and needs which came from a lockdown, which came from less business, of a business development? And then we see the demand changing into digital banking. And how do we address that uh, together with our suppliers? And how do we address that as banks in this region? And what experiences do we have outside of this region? Um, because of time, uh, we will be stopping at 2 p.m. Ghana time, so we will be able to catch up a little bit, just we take 10 minutes off. Uh, and I think what we should do is having an introduction of each panel member of about two, two and a half minutes, uh, uh, tell them uh, their experiences, their views, and I ask them in our preparations uh, phase, I ask them to come up with one single sentence or expression which shows who they are, what they stand for, and what their views are on the, on the pandemic and the post-pandemic pot uh, potential of, of digital banking. Um, and, uh, so 10 minutes, 15 minutes of introduction, uh, a, a panel discussion, 
And at the end, we'd love to have some kind of an interaction with the audience for about 10 minutes. And let's see how that works. If the chat box works well or the direct messages work well, then we can manage that as well. So let's first start with an introduction. I will introduce myself as Lars because I think that's how my mother uh, taught, raised me. And then therefore also we need to start with the lady first, Dina. Do you feel comfortable to introduce yourself for a few, uh, few minutes and give us your expression of how you look at the future of digital banking in the one sentence? Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'll make it very short in order to save time. Uh, I'm Dina Barai, I'm a co-founder and board member and former CEO of HR Revolution Middle East, one of the first growing business magazines uh, in the MENA region, specialized in the human capital aspects. Uh, I have uh, uh, participated in, uh, in a number of consultancy projects uh, in the area of human resources management in many industries uh, such as uh, food and beverage, information technology, engineering, security and brokerage, uh, uh, health care and financial services, I can say I, I have a little bit long experience in the financial institutions uh, and working for financial institutions diversified from the stock market, uh, security and brokerage, and finally, and the longest one uh, is uh, a banking sector. Uh, I have leveled uh, lots of training programs and uh, and and my current research interests are the area of agile hr the effect of artificial intelligence and big data and digital transformation on the future of the human capital uh, i know it may be a little bit uh, strange for part of the audience to find someone like me invited as a speaker in order to uh, that have uh, hr background uh, in order to uh, participate in such events. Uh, and I think this is uh, because of the well-known stereotype and phenomena of that HR and digital transformation, especially in the banking sector are enemies. Uh, and the popular belief that digital transformation increases the complexity uh, of organizational and relational models, forcing the HR department to adapt and, and evolve its uh, service offering. Uh, as we know, change has become uh, a constant in itself. So uh, this structural need for transformation has a major impact on uh, post hard organizational aspects uh, like uh, structure, business model, uh, performance indicators, as well as a soft aspects uh, like human uh, assets, culture and management style as well. Uh, it has taken a few years for banks and financial uh, institutions to move on uh, from the idea of digital transformation, focusing on technology above all. Now they need to go further and acknowledge that a successful transformation depends on the ability to correctly tackle the human challenge. In fact, uh, when transformation projects fail, it is mostly because they prioritize technical uh, tools and solutions over the change really means for the bank and its employees. Putting people first means considering a whole range of challenges, uh, but every time positioning the CHRO as one uh, of the leaders of the digital transformation, uh, and finally, I think I'm here today in order to dig deep and, uh, and find uh, with you the answer uh, of that question, of the dilemma, if that HR and digital transformation in the banking sector are really friends or enemies. That's all. Thank you, Arun. Dina, that was kind of a very strong introduction, I have to say. You, you touch a lot of aspects of digital banking. That's pretty clear, dig, of digitization, actually, across industries. You're based out of Egypt, correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, and... My magazine, uh, I'm sorry, Arun, for the interruption. No, no, go uh, uh, I have employees and volunteers, uh, uh, around 140 uh, employees all over the world, from starting from states. Uh, ending to India and starting from Russia, ending to Australia. Uh, and we have office in Dubai as well. All right. All right. Uh, I think uh, you started with, I'm going to keep it short. 
And I think I think what um, you did, sorry. You, no, I, I still think it was a good introduction. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I, I definitely will in the discussion later on ask you. Okay, human capital is there? How do you deal with human capital? If there's fear for automation, uh, new skills required. If there's a change yes. in culture in a company and how that all works. And I think we're very lucky to have you on this panel to hear about your experiences and your views on this. But let me let me take the next step for introducing the next one before we get into the discussion. But thank you so much, Dina. Dennis, Dennis, would you be so kind to introduce yourself, uh, put, put out uh, what your views are and make this one single sentence at the end of what you're, what, what you, how you want to be yeah, perceived or how you want to be remembered. Dennis, go ahead. All right, thank you, Erwin. Uh, my name is Dennis Zaga. I oversee digital innovation in First City Monument Bank, Nigeria, uh, specifically in the SME sector. Okay, so I'm a segment person um, looking into digital. Now, COVID-19 has come upon us in 2020 and it has changed everything. Um, the way it impacted my deliverables as someone who oversees digital for the segment was it actually helped us to engage our customers more. So especially earlier on in the year, because of the lockdown, a lot of people couldn't move around. And so they had to, we saw adoption, we saw a rise in the adoption of uh, digital channels. Also, as we continued engagement through webinars, uh, more and more people were able to engage us more. And uh, for me, the takeaway from all that has happened and still happening and the changes we are in and the new normal we hope to see is um, the user. The user is really very critical. So our customers are really very critical in building our solutions and looking at the customer journeys to ensure that we are building from the customer's perspective. That has really come to fore with, uh, with the way digital has been thrown off with COVID-19. So I think that would be my statement. My statement would be, Focus on user experience, focus on what the customer wants. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, thank you so much. Just a short question uh, uh, on, on, uh, on the first, first City Monument Bank. When, when, when the lockdown came and the increase and the uptake of digital interaction uh, began, were you, were, you, were you ready? Was your infrastructure ready? Was your application layer ready? Or did you have to instantly build and expand your, your environment? Okay, um, good question. I don't think anybody was 100% ready, you know, so of course we were, we were, we were caught on our ways. But um, some things we had started last year, we could now focus on and do more with. So for instance, we had um, rolled out an um, online account opening solution. And you can imagine this is more complex for businesses, for registered businesses. This is not just an individual you're trying to onboard. So there's documentation involved. So we had started that last year and we could now really drive that some more. Of course, uh, digital channels, those um, things like mobile app, things like internet banking, we could do more with that. Another thing uh, we had recently started um, was a platform. So we had started a, match, a platform for our, our SMEs and it was not just a trading or a merchant selling platform. It was essentially a platform for engagement. So engagement across all our offerings, all our products really. And we, we saw at the adoption there was phenomenal. We saw that again, especially this was driven because people really couldn't get to move around, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, in summary, uh, whilst we were not hundred percent ready, but because we had put some things in place, it was easier for us to pivot, if you will, and go with the flow of the new normal. So once the once the pandemic is uh, is hopefully coming in in uh, to an end somewhere in 2021, uh, and we we come back to a level of normalcy, do you think the uptake in digital banking will be sustained, and and we will stick to this new level, or do we go back to brick and mortar, uh, as it as a brick and click? I heard somebody say, but do, what what do you think will happen once once we we go back to normalcy? Okay, so I think, uh, I think like everyone has been saying, I think it's a new normal. So it's definitely not the old normal. And I do not see brick and mortar going away anytime soon. We would have, uh, some people have changed in their behavior, which is what COVID-19 has done really. It's changed behavior, it's changed habits. 
And I think people will continue with that. We also will continue with more in our digital space to engage customers. So I, I see 2021 and beyond as it's a mix of both, really. I don't see brick and mortar or brick and click going away anytime soon. We we'll probably will have more people adopting digital than before. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you for the elaborate introduction and already answering a few Thanks. of my questions. Uh, Leopold. Thanks, Leopold. Uh, Guarantee Trust Bank, good name, big name in the market. The divisional head digital banking. I'm pretty sure you have quite some experience. You can compare uh, the times and the experiences you had in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic update in the beginning versus what happened before and how it affected you and your team uh, and your bank and most of all your clients. Leopold. Good morning, good morning, good afternoon. And I think good evening, depending on where you are. I am just like what you said, I'm Leopold. I, I think it's not an understatement to say the world has changed. Every area of our social life has been affected. And one, it's become a necessity for us to go into isolation. And I think that is what COVID has brought to us. Human contact has been amended to mitigate the risk of the spread. And that is where digitalization is very important because it has stepped in to bridge the gap uh, between us interacting physically and continual extending services. We have been driving, we have been on this uh, digitalization journey for years. But what COVID has taught us is to enable us to test all the infrastructure we've put in place and also take advantage of the opportunities. Because then we can now quickly scale up businesses. There is the need for businesses to scale up and we can drive adoption. And I like what the deputy uh, governor said earlier that it's not just digital digitalization. But the ultimate goal should be driving adoption, utilization, and scaling our businesses. And we can only do that when we reinvent the traditional ways of mm. doing things. And that is what we, the journey we've embarked on. My tax within the bank is not just to digitalize, but create value for all stakeholders. And all stakeholders include customers, include the shareholders, including our partners. We see all our business businesses within the bank, our corporate, commercial, and SMEs as partners to also enable them to also scale up their businesses. And we've put in place the infrastructure and the tools to enable them to scale up their businesses, extend their services to their customers, and in the midst of that, also enable us to attract new customers. For us, the goal is not the present base, but getting the unbanked and the underbanked under the same umbrella. And that, 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 that's been the project we've been working on for the past few years. Very, very interesting. Uh, if, if you put, put a number against the uptake since the pandemic, uh, do you see a significant, you must have seen a significant growth in volumes of transactions, digital transactions, maybe digital onboarding. Can you put a number against it? What percentage maybe of your clients or your, your, your transaction is, 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 what is the uptake more or less? We've seen an average of about 20,000 sign-ons of digital channels by existing customers. And most of our services are self-service and they are online. So we've also seen increase in transaction counts. And more importantly, new customers also opening accounts. It's, it's average about 20%. And we, we see it growing because as I said, it, it provides us with opportunity to tap into an area we have never uh, utilized before. Thank you, Leopold. Thanks, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for your time. Thanks for, for being available. I'm going to switch over to our next uh, panel member, Jafet. Jafet, um, we, we had a little chat beforehand, and I'm kind of impressed about what you're doing, uh, micro investments and enabling those. Uh, and maybe in this audience, there might be also for your other activities, your venture capital uh, on, on fintech. Uh, there might be some candidates for, for you. I don't know, but maybe you can do your introduction better than I did, Jafet. And there is a sound. Uh, you might want to push, Jafet. You might want to push the mute button and then, yeah. I've done it there already. <laughs> My lip reading skills are in development since Zoom came in, but this is easier. Good My meeting. My name is Jafet Munyoki. I'm the CEO of Goods and Capital Partners. Um, we, we started in 2010 
initially as an investment banking uh, boutique outfit that handled advisory and asset management. Um, on the asset management specifically to like, you know, sort of stick to the digital banking conference sort of space uh, conversation and theme. We, we have a VC fund that looks at FinTech specifically. And that's basically businesses that are into disruption, this intermediation and financial inclusion. And of course, they must be serving a proper need that can be identified, not like a nice to have sort of um, uh, add on. Now, when, when we looked at our business model, we figured that we need to look at the trends that we've seen internationally. So one of them was the US gig economy. So we looked at numbers. I think the last stats we had was 2018, where 57 million people that comprom comprise 36% of the population actually in the gig economy. So we figured that's where things will move into Africa. And the biggest problem is for us as an organization, we also know that we cannot think as a big sort of organization if we need to survive. We have to think as a startup for us to survive. And that's basically like, you know, the theme of my conversation today. If you're post COVID, I think for survival for any business, as a CEO, I know one of my roles is to make sure there's enough money in the bank, but how do I get that to happen? One, I need to make sure that we think like a startup and we agile for us to be able to survive. Now, when we look at the Africa economy, where we're going in terms of even what's earmarked for digital tech and digital infrastructure spend until 2030 is roughly a hundred billion dollars. So essentially that will move the whole mobile penetration by roughly 10%, which experts of course believe 2.5% of growth GDP per capita will happen just because of that spend only and because of that penetration. So essentially what does that mean for us as a business? We like, listen, we have to be transformed as, a, as an organization to be able to manage, to be operationally resilient. And that's why we looked at your, your, your micro sort of investment space. Now, the example that I gave in our conversation was the Kenyan border border uh, sort of investments on a daily basis. So essentially, minimum investments is 50 US cents, which they can afford. It's less than even a quarter of per trip sort of ride. Um, it's the same with sort of investing in Okoda sort of operators in Nigeria, so to speak. So essentially, for us, when we looked at it, we already can see the numbers are more than a million. At 50 US cents, it's basically half a million dollars on a daily basis and they work Monday to Monday. Essentially, it's, it's the same conversation around a gig economy in the US is different from a gig economy in Kenya, but essentially it's the same sort of concept. So essentially for us, we looked at it from that standpoint. Now, when we also look at what's happening in the industry from a trend perspective, we're seeing also regulators getting to change in terms of thinking. So essentially when you look at your capital markets authority in Kenya has already allowed a robo-advisor um, tech company to actually start testing. So essentially what that means is that now you don't need physical bodies to be able to do advisory, but you're able to actually have robots that do that in the process. So essentially it's happening in the continent. Two, when you look at Johannesburg Stock Exchange, they've actually allowed a crowdfunding platform to be activated on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It's the biggest exchange in the continent, contributes close to 55% of, of transactions in the continent. But for crowdfunding, this is basically a big win. It's something that you wouldn't have had before. And that also comes with a Bitcoin platform. So essentially, we're looking at Bitcoin, blockchain technologies, and crowdfunding to be able to do peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, when you look at what has happened in Nigeria, for example, Kuda Bank raised, and it's a digital bank, raised $10 million the other day. And that's the biggest seed amount that we've seen in the continent because the average is $4 million globally. But at Justin, $10 million, And if, yes. if, if we look at your venture capital fund, how much do you have to share? $15 million. 
All right, which is even more. And we look at we look at businesses that we can invest up to half a million dollars by entity. So essentially the truck is for 700 companies. We've chosen 60. We will only invest in 40 of those. And that's basically on fund one. On fund two, we'll have series A and series B that will now go up to 10 million and 20 million per entity respectively. All right, Javed, I, th I think we get a very big picture of, of, of what you're doing. What I think in summary is you're starting to stimulate, uh, well, you see changes in terms of regulations, you see changes in terms of revenue streams moving into digital space, and you are there to stimulate the fintechs which have added value. Uh, they need to show their added value. If there's in the audience fintech companies which think, hey, we need some, some initial funding, can they still contact you and still get in touch yeah, with definitely. you? Yeah, definitely. What definitely. What requirements do you have to a fintech uh, in order to be uh, enabled by your team? How can you... Um, for us, what we need is to be able to have a prototype. We need to be able to have a solid sort of management team. Essentially, we're willing to want to invest in a one-man sort of team. Uh, so, so, you know, normally what happens is that there is always that belief that every sort of startup must have at least two minimum founders that basically complement each other from a skill perspective and to being able to like see exactly what need they're solving because there must be a problem that has to be solved because essentially from there in terms of scaling those businesses in terms of being able to unlock our relationships in the continent to be able to benefit them from a pipeline perspective in terms of projects then that we're happy to do so essentially that's the main thing I remember from last year we had, and there's a speaker later on in the agenda, he's called Eric Anon. He's a Kubitix, I don't, I don't know what his funding looks like, but I can see some matches with audience members, maybe panel members, maybe and with your business. So I would recommend everybody to connect with you, uh, maybe in the discussion, but otherwise afterwards, and your contact details are there. So thank you so much, uh, Jafet. I'm going to move into uh, the next part, uh, part person on the panel to give the opportunity to do the introduction. Timofe, Finastra, a big name. Uh, I know your headquarters here in, or your regional headquarters here in Dubai. Uh, you are the country manager of West Africa, Timofe. What, what, can you introduce yourself a little bit further than I did and give your insights on market development since COVID-19 or the pandemic, uh, the current uptake in digital what does it mean to you? Uh, what, how can you help banks and how can banks then help their customers the best with solutions you have in mind? Timofa, feel free. If you're there, of course. Did we lose you? Sounds a little bit quiet. I'm pretty sure um, with Mohammed in the background that he will do everything possible to get him over participating with us. Once he comes back, I propose that we give him then the space for the one or two minutes introduction. So we know for sure that he will be able to join us. I've been told that Krishna Kant won't be able to make it. So we have a select group, which means we can a little share a little bit more about what our ideas are and uh, what our plans are. Uh, and once the mom uh, and or uh, Krishna can't come in, we can make them join and make it a bigger group. Uh, at least that's how I think it works for me. Hey, um, I, I think I, I, I owe everybody also a small uh, introduction because asking everybody questions and then you might think in the back of your head, who is this guy? What's he doing? And why does he ask all these kind of questions? First of all, I'm Dutch, which means sometimes I can be direct. Uh, so please correct me if I'm saying questions or saying things where you think, hey, that was not the way I would phrase it. Uh, so bear with me with my culture. But normally that also means we're honest, uh, we're loyal uh, and we stick to our ground. Next to that, I'm, I'm positioned here as global banking expert. I love that. Um, it was actually, I was in my, uh, in my sabbatical, not completely self-chosen, COVID-19 uh, made some people redundant amongst myself. but. I took the time to consider my options and then Mohammed more or less woke me up and said, can you please help us? Last year you were doing a speaking session in, uh, in, in this summit. We enjoyed your presence. It looked like you enjoyed yourself as well. So maybe you can step up. And I think maybe I live in Dubai, so I come back from the beach and I think I'll do a few of these sessions. And 
This one is, uh, is the first one I'm joining. So I'm very happy uh, that Mohammed woke me up and I'm very happy to be here in history, 15 years of ING Group. You might've heard of ING Direct a long time ago, which was one of the first digital banks ever. Um, I, believe, I believe so. <laughs> ah, look at this, Stenhofer. Hi, I was just introducing myself and I agreed with everybody once you're in. Wow, you're a nice, nice space, by the way. Are you going to do surgery soon? This is very, very wide. But anyway, 15 years of ING Group, four and a half years of IBM. IBM transferred me over to Dubai. And within IBM, I had the responsibility for Africa, Middle East, and, uh, and Pakistan and Turkey for their payment solutions, traveling a lot, not that much to, uh, to Ghana uh, yet, but Temenos changed that. Temenos said, we want to do something more than core banking. We want to be good at digital banking, which means the omni-channel platform. We want to be good at payment solutions. So we have a payment hub. We want you to help us establish a bigger footprint in MIA. So I did that for two years, also coming to Accra, for example, and speaking last time on behalf of Terminals. As now I am considering my, uh, my opportunities for the future, but that's why I'm positioned here as global banking expert. So Mohamed, thank you for that. Hey, Tomova, it's enough about me. Yeah. Tomova, thanks for, for being able to join us. You have a beautiful white background. Is that the new office of Finastra? <laughs> This is the new virtual no. <laughs> Okay, so th thanks, Erwin, and, and good evening, everyone. Tomorrow. My name is Tamufa Obon. I am responsible for our uh, business in West Africa. Come over. I'm sorry to interrupt you. But Can you hear me now? I have the feeling your bandwidth is, a, is an issue. If you is make it up the camera, yes. is the it audio could, could, could get better. All right. Please go ahead if it's better now. Let's test. Is it better now? It works for me. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So, um, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome, Melvin. So, my name is Timofe. I. I, I am responsible for Finastra's business in um, West Africa, English speaking West Africa, I'm based out of Lagos. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have a software company and a platform company, we basically produce and offer services within the finance uh, industry. Um, you know, to the point around this discussion on COVID and, and, and post-COVID and some of the things that we've seen, um, we think that, um, we believe actually, um, Erwin, that um, the future is here, the future is opened, and COVID has sort of brought the future forward to us. Because one of the things that Finastra has done very well is to sort of, you know, respond to some of the concerns that banks have, um, have raised to us. Uh, and I think it has largely been discussed on this platform. How do we, how do they ensure that their customers are, uh, you know, consuming their, their products? How can they move from brick and mortar to, you know, brick and click, so to speak, like someone said on the platform? And, and that just brings us to what we call um, the fusionfabric.com, which is essentially a platform that allows the key players in the financial industry, we talk about the fintechs, you talk about the banks, you talk about um, the developers, um, systems integrators, universities, and all the all the people, the stakeholders in the finance industry, you know, sort of come together and, and build this ecosystem that allows two, two, two things. One, it allows a high level of innovation and collaboration. I, I think it was first bank, there's someone that was talking about the high level of collaboration that they, they're doing in their, in their, in their, in their business, which I think is very, very important. And this really is what um, um, the fusionfabric.cloud really brings to us. Um, and we believe that in this season where, you know, the experience has caused a lot of things to change, to burn a lot of um, uh, uh, new innovations into the, into the financial sector. Um, Fusion Fabric, the cloud, gives banks and financial services the opportunity. 
All right. Oh. Sounds... Hear me now. Yeah, I can hear you again. You're having difficulty. Is it better? Yeah, there you are. Can you hear me? Uh, there's this metal, metal sound in your voice, which means you're in and out. Not 100%. Hello? No. I'm sorry, Tomov. It seems to be technically complicated. My, my suggestion is that we go to the... Hello, please. No. I think uh, is uh, we we might enter the group discussion now, and once you read, is it better? Uh, you're still trying. Okay, F feel free to try once again. Please go ahead, Tomovo. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, th I think because of time constraints, we have 15 minutes left, and then uh, Leopold will need to go for the next uh, for his next activity. We need to leverage on that as much as possible. I would say once the month is capable to return, uh, definitely we'll give all the floor uh, to make sure his introduction gets finished and he participates in the discussion as much as possible. Is that a guys? The team, are you okay with that? Immediately, a test of your audio is on. Yeah, we okay with that. Yeah, that's right. good. Fine. Wonderful. Hey, let, let's start with the beginning because we, we talk in this conference and that is, of course, the topic of today, digital banking and maybe yeah, the, the way uh, digital banking has picked up and, and, and uh, yeah, accelerated because of the pandemic. But what, we, what we, we also see is there's an economical impact. So there's a health impact, there's a digital solution, but at the end of the day, there, it is harder to do business for a lot of parties, which means small, medium enterprises are barely surviving. Small, medium enterprises might have loans with you as a bank uh, and, and need a little bit of help uh, to maybe have different uh, period of time to pay off for anything. We know central bank and their stimulus packages and everything, but what are the banks doing? And maybe Leopold, I can start with you. What, what, how is Guaranteed Trust Bank looking at the, yeah, the economic struggle the small medium enterprises are going through? And, and how can you lend a hand? Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's clear the SMEs are the backbone of the economic development of the country. And they've played a major role in, in, in developing and, and sustaining our economy. What banks have done, and it, it started from straight uh, from the central bank, where banks were encouraged to either reduce or freeze interest, and then also introduce moratorium to some of the facilities that they have. That, I believe, is just a basic that banks can do. And what we as Guaranteed Brands Bank have started doing is to help them to scale up their businesses. We came up with a product late last year uh, called SME Suits that enables businesses to have some form of web presence in terms of presenting their wares or their services in addition to receiving payments. And I, I believe that solution was something that helped us to position ourselves in readiness for the COVID. So at the peak of the COVID, and I'm sure most of you, most, most, most people in Ghana who attest to the fact that we realized one of the things that the country was exposed is the absence of a large pool of domestic e-commerce platforms. Mm -hmm. Yes, e-services in terms of topping up your credits, uh, renewing your Netflix subscription, DSTV, those services are always available. But what about buying a goods, something basic? Mm -hmm. you, there's still the level of human interaction. And that is what that product uh, has stepped in to resolve. And we believe that is the opportunity we are picking from COVID and is going to help us to scale up businesses. So most of the SMEs within our portfolio have started signing on to that product to help them to have any, it, it costs less than $40, between $40 to $150 a year to have full web presence and payment capabilities. That sounds, sounds like a wonderful idea indeed for helping SMEs to have a presence on the digital space. 
how, how is then the fulfillment? Because if you want to order something, it also needs to be delivered and there's maybe some stock. Is there something you have a role in or this is something just SME needs to take care of? We, we've looked at the entire value chain. So SMEs and then even the delivery capabilities must be there. And we've taken all into consideration. We've taken that pressure of the SMEs. And what we have been encouraging them is to focus on their service. And then we have introduced third parties because this is a, this is a period for collaboration and partnerships. So we brought in third parties within the value chain to ensure that services are delivered seamlessly. Okay. Very, very nice. Dennis, Dennis, how, how are things at First City Monument Bank? Uh, if you turn, talk about, first of all, eh, what we've said earlier is we go from economic to functional to application and maybe some IT solution. That's why we have the value chain here. Dennis, in, in your mind, uh, in, what has the bank done in terms of economic, were there lots of microcredits required and which you had to, 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 to provide a solution to? Or Dennis, what, what was at your bank? Uh, the approach on making sure the pandemic, imp the economical impact was controlled. Okay, so um, for SMEs, the biggest thing, one of the biggest things rather in their world is financing. You know, so my colleague already uh, alluded to that. So first there was the package, uh, stimulus package from the CBN, but what we did was, uh, uh, so internally we uh, reduced some rates and also gave moratorium periods. Yeah, extended uh, moratorium periods for repayment across all our loan product types, really. Um, another thing we did more of was uh, we have a unique offering for women-owned, women-managed businesses, all you right. know, and under that we have zero interest loans, you know, so yeah, to, to, to select uh, participants or select uh, customers, and we did more of that this year. Uh, we also have a um, capacity mentorship building uh, program under that as well, which we, we I, I think the, the, the share number that went through that during this period was also increased because we needed to impact customers better. Um, on our advisory beat, we do a lot on advisory. So but there's, there's a whole team that's handling that. And um, uh, one, one of the things that, uh, we started with last year's risk sharing structure, which uh, essentially allows your customers to manage their collateral cover in a very ingenious way, you know, and by taking that with certain um, external parties, DFIs and extending it to our customers, we saw a big opportunity to do more of that in during this, this pandemic period to support our customers who clearly did not have enough to collateralize the loans, even the loans that they could um, access based on their credit score. Um, the last thing we I, I will talk about is on our SME platform. You know, so uh, registration is free, and for now, so unlike my colleague in GTB, we are offering only services for now. We've not started uh, selling products. So you, if you have, if you're a merchant, a customer, and you have a service that you sell, legal service, tax services. You can come register there, it's for free. Uh, we have like an escrow account service that ensures that payments are secured. So you, once service is confirmed, then a uh, payment is made to the merchant and all every party is uh, essentially taken care of. So these are some of the highlights, you know, that, that we have done to try and make things uh, more manageable for, for our customers. This is in addition to some other, um, social responsibilities that the bank has carried out also although that clearly impacts more um, across all segments of customers beyond the ones i oversee yeah thank you thank you it sounds sounds to me from both uh, from both leopold as from you is that, that that digital banking because we digital banking is then the enabler for for pushing out the solutions for for, for the clients that digital banking is also diversification. If I hear e-commerce as a solution, a platform for SMEs, for services, I hear digital banking is not just changing the organization in the bank, but it's also helping providing digital services to your end customers and helping your SMEs to, to create an environment or to have an environment in which they can reach their clients. Uh, so, so we need to think a little bit bigger when we talk about digital we, we don't talk about just operations and changing of the interaction between bank and client, but also expanding the set of services. Is that, is that, that correct, Leopold? Uh, 
Dennis. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that is. So um, across what he has said and what I've been saying, it's, um, like I've said, we always need to lead with what the customer wants. I realize as bankers, we get to stock in developing solutions that we think, hey, this is what they want, you know. So we have learned that painfully over the years. So we now we always lead with customers, engaging them to know uh, what is exactly that they want. And then we do go through a process of iterative tests to ensure that it is continually refined, you yeah. know. And what we... So the expression of that is leading with digital. For instance, we we do away with a lot of forms. We want to do away with a lot of forms. There's a recent um, enhancement that I brought for um, onboarding onto web payment engine. Historically, or prior to, to when I launched that, you always had to go into the branch to fill a form, drop it, and then you to be processed and you'll be profiled. But now we've created a digital platform where you can just go, if you're a customer, you put in your account details, we validate you, and then press to. You can, your profile can be created. If you are a non-customer, so we've been extended to non-customers, and, and they can also be assisted, even though they are not customers of the bank. Yeah, so we do have that lead, that thought perspective leading what we do. Right. I'm, I'm going to invite uh, the other panel members just to respond to what we're saying. Because at the end of the day, we wanted to have a small discussion. If I look at the time, we have a few minutes left. So, uh, Dina, just, I'm just going to invite you. Because you hear it's not just the bank in itself and the bank organization itself. It's also expanding services. It's also maybe thinking and putting yourself further in the shoes of your client. How does it relate to your human capital perspective and your objectives? And, uh, and how do you comment on what, what just uh, Leopold and, and Dina were sharing? Hi, hello, Urban. Uh, if you are, if you are talking about uh, the effect of the of COVID nineteen uh, on the banking sector and especially in uh, on human resources and human capital uh, in the banking, uh, I'll say it's uh, for the short time. It was very harmful uh, in terms of uh, salaries. We are paying salaries in terms of productivity and in terms uh, as well of. Uh, of working uh, hours, but uh, if we thought about, uh, if we are thinking about uh, long-term effects, uh, so uh, on the long-term effect, it was very helpful uh, from the from the perspective of the banking sector have an incredible employment opportunity to drive uh, forward digital transformation. Uh, as well, uh, it's accelerating the, the applying of, uh, of the digital transformation idea. Uh, I, I don't like to say that, but this is what happened. Uh, it is uh, forced or, or make the change of behaviors and habits uh, to be imposed on the employees. And uh, it helps us to adopt uh, lots of strategies such as uh, working from home, uh, and uh, uh, and such technique uh, yeah. we are using now and uh, yes yeah I think yeah. about the effect of uh, pandemic yeah so so slowly but surely we're moving into the silver lining yeah, so so we have a pandemic it has cost the human life it does cost us economically but there is a silver lining and the silver lining is moving forward into a digital space enhancing what we were already thinking of what we wanted to do in our our industry and i and i think if we if we take uh, i think timova is back timova if we talk about silver lining and talk about uh, your support your capabilities to support the industry and the players here in the in the team uh, just, just Timova, is there a silver lining in your perspective, and and uh, how how will you handle it from your perspective? And yeah, no need to raise your hand. Just uh, just just jump in, Timov. You're back, right? Yes, I am back. Thanks, Erin. Uh, no, no thanks to tech, to to network. Um, I think there is a silver lining. Um, a lot of companies, a lot of banks that we've actually spoken with. Um, some of our customers, um, they've also shared some concerns. Um, and w one thing I, I, I hear very, very strongly, you know, in, uh, a, with some of our customers is how do we, um, how, how do they bridge the gap between delivering a service and also bringing in that, that, that face of empathy 
um, so that um, the, the customers, they, their customers can be at least as comfortable going through this whole pandemic era. Uh, and one of the things I have also seen, you know, some of our customers have done um, is sort of cushioning the effect um, on, on some of the facilities that some of their customers are already having with them um, to enable these customers, um, you know, gain themselves again, if, 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 you, if you like, and, and be able to uh, put themselves together from a, from a, from a business perspective. Um, so really, I mean, there is a silver lining in, in my view, really. Yeah. Yeah, I think the move, I think for you, the opportunity is to support banks even more with your solutions you have in mind, uh, and maybe even step to the regulator and say the digital onboarding, things in the cloud. We need a little bit of your support because we have a different kind of environment. But Javed, Javed, if you hear this, the silver lining, what do you think if you if you look, okay, we have had all these problems and we are capable to step up and cater for our clients. What's the silver lining according to you? I think, I think this sort of um, leapfrogs what most of the organizations wanted to achieve in the next sort of 10 years. All of that has just, you know, sort of had to be implemented within a short time, which is basically six months because it's everything, customer experience and being able to like, you know, acquire new customers and be able to serve them regardless of whether there's human contact or not. Um, so, so the silver lining in my view is now we're going to see a leapfrog in terms of technology uptake. We're going to see a leapfrog in terms of solutions being provided and we're going to lead, to see solutions that will be more futuristic as opposed to where it's like sort of slow and painful process to get to the future. Um, I think I think also entities are looking at what happens in 2021 and there's more lockdowns or another pandemic or whatever. So essentially everyone is looking at the future is basically digital and it's time to invest in it and it's time to like, you know, sort of, implement all those plans that had been delayed for whatever reason or excuses that had been provided. So essentially, I think this is good for the continent. It's good for everyone. It's good for business and it's good for tech. So, so essentially, because we have, we have everything, we've just, you know, sort of never had the sense of urgency to implement all that. So I guess this, this has been the chance. This has been the push that was just needed for that to happen. All right, you and, and, and sorry, Erwin. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, and just to add to Jaffet's point, um, one of the things, because I'm not sure where I got caught off when I was trying to talk about um, Finastra, and one of the things that we've also done, uh, you know, in, in terms of bringing support to um, customers, and really is around um, what I what we call the um, futurefabric.cloud. Essentially, what that means, you know, again, we're talking about by the, the new norm is how do we um, support banks in terms of digital through their digitalization journey? How do we ensure that um, they are, they are, the banks themselves, uh, especially the IT units, become more profit profit centers as opposed to cost centers? And how do they do more with less? You know, so in, in that level or from that angle. Um, uh, in what we've done again is to introduce again the the fusionfabric.cloud which is a platform um, service that really helps banks to one you know help them in the way they consume consume um, software and also monetize that software and, and we've seen a lot of uh, positive response from from some of our customers within the african space and of course in the european space so that that, that for me is key uh, with, with regards to supporting the customers all right. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Malvo. Thanks for the contribution, and also very happy that you're back. We can hear you very properly. But we we it takes effort, but when you get there, you get there. That's good. In in my eyes, if I do a summary a little bit, so we have seen that banks step up and take their social responsibility. We also see it's not just banks, but it's diversification of the services. We have understood that the human capital impact in in working from remote, salary cuts. Uh, being redundant, as I know personally, uh, is, is a short-term impact. On the longer-term impact, we see actually that the profit uh, or, or, or the, yeah, the, 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 uh, the silver lining. I still want to be very cautious to say 
the positive side because the negative side is still so much in our face, but the positive side is the acceleration and therefore the growth of business as Jav had said. I think, I think if I summarize it like this, it also opens up the door for some public discussion. If I look at the time, we're two minutes past the hour. I said we would stop at two because of uh, other engagements of our team, but maybe five minutes more for some questions out of the audience. Mohammed, can you facilitate this or uh, is there any way we can receive those questions from you, please? Are you there, Mohammed? I am very much here. Wonderful. Well, thank you for the compliment. Uh, there was a lot you mentioned about getting Timofe back. We'll talk about it now. Uh, okay, from uh, the audience, just real quick. Uh, the question here was, I will need to pull that up. There was one question that, okay. Uh, somebody asked me, here, let me let me get the name of the person. Just a minute. Edward Aqua. It says banks recovery from pandemic to take long say in terms of uh, the basically trying to ask that we've taken a negative uh, hit in terms of recovery of loans and with all the moratoriums. How long or short will it be until banks get back to normal operations? I mean, this is more like uh, somebody is asking you to predict the future. Would you like to comment? I think this, this is for Leopold or Dennis at first, maybe, or Java that might have an idea. I, 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 will, I will put it simple. It, it, will take, it, it will depend on how long all of us will recover. Banks don't operate in isolation. So it's a larger community and all of us must work together to, to, to recover from COVID. Yeah. So it depends on all, all of us. We need to get a vaccine going. Everybody must be okay with COVID. Businesses must come back. And then we can now talk about all of us back uh, to the new normal. I'm, I'm gonna be daring, Leopold. I'm gonna say, well, this is gonna happen uh, first, we have the vaccine roll out in 2021, maybe in September, October, we are maybe almost vaccinated, if not, if not a little bit later. So 2021 is a, re is a, is a recovery year, or st actually sustain of the problem. 2022 might be a recovery year, 2023 still another one. So maybe we're talking 24, is that a, I'm just going to be bold here because I can't really say it. But how, do, how does that sound? Are you saying that we only meet again as a conference in 2024? No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying the impact, the economical impact on banks and when they recovered, as the question was phrased. But hopefully we can meet very soon in person. In Dubai, it's already quite... I have the wine bottle I bought for you. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, Mohammed. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry for the interruption. Uh, I'd like to answer about this, uh, answer this question from the point of view of the HR uh, in banks uh, or in banking sector. In my mind, uh, I don't want to be uh, pessimistic, but in my mind, it will never uh, back to the same HR function before the pandemic or before the digital transformation uh, era. Uh, there is real uh, changes happened. Uh, there is uh, almost uh, lots of jobs uh, threatened and uh, changing job rules in the banking sector. Uh, some jobs have uh, already changes and its rules changes. Uh, it's uh, the mindset changes. Uh, new skills uh, required for the new job rules and uh, reskilling the, the staff uh, is most. And, uh, Lots of new techniques like uh, Agile and uh, OPS. So uh, I don't want, and it will never back the same before the pandemic. Clear. Right, okay. I, I think uh, you have a point there. I think we have to get used to this new normal. But let's look at the time because I think it was a clear answer, and Leo, you had a good answer as well. Mohammed, is there, were there more questions? No, actually, that was the only question we received. However, I would like to say something. Uh, the, the, the panel uh, discussion, the, the topic for the panel was, uh, was 
the future of BFSI post pandemic and measures to be taken to convert crisis into advantage and improve, improve current business modules, right? Uh, it's no way related to BFSI, but uh, I, we have kind of used, uh, I, I, I personally uh, was, we've never really done uh, online conferences, right? Uh, Irwin's been to one of our conferences and, and a lot of you have, in fact, Leopold as well. So I think this has kind of helped us, the current uh, crisis has helped us take advantage and improve uh, you know, the current business modules as a result of which uh, today we gather here with, with more audience than last year and, and uh, you know, information packed sessions and so much to take back in terms of learning without having to fly over to different countries. So uh, we are getting, getting uh, used to the new normal, like you said, Erwin. Okay, Mohammed. Yeah, yeah. Just an ending note from my from my side. I, I, I love the personal interaction, and I, I I'm happy I'm at home. I'm happy I'm not pushing out CO2 with the plane uh, w when I'm traveling. But definitely, I will. I'm looking forward to the personal interaction because having this great panel, it's it's wonderful. And I want to thank you very much for being on this panel. But I would really, really love and look forward to shaking your hand or at least in person. Uh, uh, greet you and thank you for, for, for your participation and I really look forward to that. But let's grab this opportunity to see this as a need as a positive, see it as, as, as growth of business and see it as an opportunity, although it was a challenging environment which got us here. Uh, any, any points from the panel which I sh we should have touched which you are missing? Leo, from you? I, I would just sum up by saying that one of the things COVID has taught us is that there's too much unfinished business for us to continue maintaining the status quo. That means new strategies must come in and it will take everybody, both financial sector, that is a dominant player within the ecosystem, and others to recover and, and make the world a better place for everybody. That's, those are nice closing words. I like that. Dennis. Any closing words from you? I'm just gonna wrap up. Dennis, you're not with us anymore. All right, I understand. Ah, no. Uh, Jaffet, closing statement. Um, I think I think what what our take should be is we already know that we have a widening digital divide in the continent. We need to know what opportunities are there and be able to ascertain them and then plan to be able to, you know, transform our organizations to be able to like, you know, sort of provide those solutions. And it will also bring operational resilience to our businesses in the end. And, and the audience people who want to contact you, their contact details can be found definitely. via Mohammed, right? Definitely, definitely. They can reach us anytime. That's perfect. That's perfect. Timofa, are you there? Just trying. No, not yeah, lucky. I am. Oh, I'm here. Ah, yeah. and a face. Well, wow, great. And a headphone. You look, you, you look very modern with the headphone too. Uh, hey, closing yeah. statement. You know, Elwin, I, I think one of the one of the big lessons that um, we've learned from this post-COVID is that um, life is important. You know, and um, human resources, the key and most important element in any business. Um, business certainly would not be business as usual, uh, but if, if businesses would have to thrive post COVID, um, then emphasis and more focus should be given to human lives. I think it's very important. Yeah. Wow, Kamalvi, you're so good in making a bridge to what I wanted to ask Dina. But uh, it's a, it's a, I, I agree, it, it's all about human beings at the end of the day. It's about how we deal with each other, how we are able to deal with changes, how we deal with impact in our own lives and how we, how we are resilient as a human being and still stay social and still stay connected. Dina, your closing statement. Thank you, Erwin. Uh, the closing statement and uh, every event closing statement is that the change is the only constant in life. Uh, so uh, if you think that, uh, if you as human think that digital transformation is creating you, uh, that's because you are not adapting to change quickly and not shortening your uh, skills. Uh, 
what came in mind when you say uh, digital transformation, that's the increasing of automation, the banking sector will lead to massive uh, trend of unemployment uh, of banking uh, workforce uh, due, to, due to digital technologies. But uh, in real, uh, it's not, it's just a change uh, like anything else. And the banking sector will provide huge opportunity in technology related jobs such as cybersecurity specialist, robot programmer, uh, blockchain architect, and uh, processes modeler expert. So work on yourself, uh, sharpen your skills, and won't be after the corona. Okay. Embrace the change. Don't be afraid. Embrace the change. That's what I hear you say. Yes. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, hey, thank you so much for, for, uh, for having this discussion. I really appreciate it getting to know you also in the preparation space. So I look forward to staying in touch with you. And I'd like to thank the audience for listening to us and uh, participating. And I hope we actually gave something uh, to the audience, which if they want to continue talking via Mohammed, contact can be done and can be picked up. And I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much, Mohammed. I would leave it to you. Thank you, Irvin. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I, I will hopefully see you very soon. Uh, and uh, we will connect again. I will, I will give you all the feedback about the panel and uh, I would request you all to uh, maybe just drop me an email on, on your experience about how the, how the panel went or the conference or the platform itself as a whole. That would be highly appreciated. And uh, I will get in touch with you soon with our 2021 calendar, yeah? Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Have a lovely one, Jape. Thank you, Dina. Take care, bye, Irvin, bye, Leo. Yes, yes. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Moving thank on. you, Mohammed. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Timofey. Bye-bye.